Tonight, I have a tremendous expectation in my spirit for what's going to happen in the next few moments. We're going to be taking communion together tonight. For some of you, it might be your first time to do that. For others of you, you've done it hundreds of times. But uh, I want you to locate where the elements are, are right now for you. They are in the seat back in front of you. Down on the bottom, you'll see a little wire holder. For those of you on the front row, uh, Pastor Tim will be bringing those around to you. Pastor Tim, those on the front row here and back there, we'll go on and get those to you so that you know what's coming in just a minute here. But at Victory Church, nothing we do is ever about a ritual. It's always about relationship. Amen, somebody? And so we're going to show you how to tap into the power uh, of Passover, everybody say Passover, through communion. And if you have a Bible tonight, I want you to take it and go to Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, and uh, I'm going to be reading beginning in verse 14. Uh, Passover started Saturday night, and the Passover feast was going on uh, when Jesus was uh, arrested and betrayed and uh, whenever he was crucified. So we're going to start in chapter 22, verse 14, and here's what it says. It says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him, and then he said to them with fervent desire. Everybody say fervent desire. He said with fervent desire. In other words, I've wanted to do this really, really bad. He said with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this what? What do you call it? Passover. Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup, everybody say the cup, and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. And we're not, we're not going to take communion yet. I want to share this truth with you first and then we'll do it at the end. Uh, but he said, I will no longer eat of this until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say, aren't y'all glad we're not sharing out the same cup tonight? I don't know about you, but, you know, anyway, we'll let that one go. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. He took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my, what? Body, which is broken for who? For you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant. Everybody say new covenant. The Old Testament's old covenant. New Testament, new covenant. In my blood, which is shed for you. Now, the Old Testament, the old covenant was established on the blood of a lamb, a bull, a goat. New Covenant is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. How many of y'all know that's better blood tonight? Yeah. Verse 21 says, But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me uh, on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And so again, tonight I want to zero in on the word Passover, because the Passover was one of the most powerful events in the entire Old Testament. The Bible begins with a book called Genesis. It goes to Exodus, right? And we, we see where God brings his people out of bondage after 400 years of living in Egypt, living under Pharaoh. He brings them out of bondage in one night, and he does it by the blood of a lamb. He has them take a lamb. Each household would take a lamb. They would sacrifice that lamb. They would take the blood of that lamb, and they would literally apply it over the door of their home. When the 10th plague hit uh, Egypt, it was the death of the firstborn son. And for those Israelites that had the blood of the lamb applied over the doorpost of their house, death passed by. Everybody say death passed by. And on that night, God brought them out. He brought them out of Egypt. He brought them out of bondage. He brought them out of slavery. He brought them out of poverty. And he set them free in one night by the blood of the lamb. And, he, and we stop short when we don't tell the rest of the story. He brought them out and there wasn't a sick or a feeble one among them. Every single one of them were healed as they fed on the Lamb of God that night. They came out healed. They came out free. They came out prosperous because they went to their neighbors and they took the silver and the gold that they had and they left. And God began to lead them through the wilderness to take them to the promised land. God provided a place for them where they could grow, where they could thrive, where they would be blessed, 
where they would become everything that God had created for them to be. And for 40 years, God provided for them. He fed them manna in the morning. Uh, you know, he fed them quail at night. So I, I always like to say Krispy Kreme in the morning, KFC at night. And so it, it was supernatural provision. Literally, the Bible says that their clothes didn't wear out. The soles of their shoes did not wear out. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I can go through some shoes. And, and they got the same shoes for 40 years, right? So God provided for them. God took care of them. God met every need. He gave them water from a rock in the middle of the desert. He guided them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And again, he was taking them to a promised land. He was taking them to a place where they could spread out and succeed to give them houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant, wells they didn't dig. And he gave them a new identity. And most importantly, they were a people marked by his presence. So when the Jews would go once a year, every Jew was required in Israel, in Jerusalem, to show up to celebrate Passover. Jerusalem is slam-packed with people. The air is just buzzing with expectation, with celebration, with excitement, with activities getting ready to celebrate the Passover because they're celebrating that God brought them out of slavery by the blood of a lamb. And so Jesus, here's what he says. He says, guys, I've looked so forward to eating the Passover with you on this night because there were some things he wanted them to understand that they had not seen before. And so he's sharing with them that in the same way that our ancestors applied the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of their house and death passed by and God saved us and God brought us out and God set us free and God prospered us and God gave us an identity and God gave us a destiny, he's saying to them, I am the Passover lamb and any person who believes in me by faith is applying the blood I shed at the cross of Calvary tomorrow to their life so that death passes by, so that you are saved so that you're set free so that you get a new identity so that you have a new destiny so that you can walk in prosperity because there was no lack in the garden of Eden come on somebody God wants you to live a life where there's nothing missing and nothing broken and you have everything you need to succeed in this life and you can be blessed so that you can be a blessing to somebody else that sound good to y'all tonight come on would you just give him praise and so it it says, it confirms this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So it says, Jesus is our Passover lamb. So Jesus is about to institute what we call the Lord's Supper. We call it communion. You might have come from a church where they called it the Eucharist, right? And, and it's where we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and it's the bread that Jesus took. Now, they would have used unleavened bread, and I have a nice big roll, and I'm wondering if Jesus had a stick of butter because I'm ready to tear into it. But anyway, he had the bread, right? And then he had the cup, the grape juice. And so there are two elements represented here that Jesus identifies and talks to us about. And he says, the cup represents my blood, which the new covenant is in. And he said, the bread represents my body that's going to be broken for you when I go to the cross of Calvary. And so those two things become our Passover, and they do for us spiritually what God did in the natural for his children in the Old Testament. The Bible says what they went through was written for our learning so that we, living in these last days, might tap into the totality, all of what Jesus bought and paid for when he died for us at the cross of Calvary. Now, I don't know about you, but Miss Jeannie, I don't want to leave anything on the table that God's made available to us so that when I meet him, I say, I enjoyed it all. I loved every bit of it. How many of y'all want everything Jesus bought and paid for? Come on, would you just give him a big praise? And so one of the most important things we can do is celebrate this because Jesus on this night, this Passover night as they're doing this, he's instituting something new, a new Passover, if you will, and that is the blood that he would shed and in the cup and, and the broken body represented in the bread. And so for us, one of the most important things we do as a church, we ever do, Missy, is to take communion. Water baptism and communion are the sacraments that God gave us. And I want to say to you tonight that where the blood is honored in faith or in preaching, there the Spirit works. And where He works, He always leads souls back to the blood. It's all about the blood of Jesus. Where the blood is honored, the presence of God descends and miracles take place. I don't know about y'all, but I didn't come here to just have church tonight. I came here to meet with Jesus. I came here to have an encounter with God. I came here to leave having walked out, been touched by the hand and the heart and the presence and the power of God. Are y'all with me tonight? Come on, just let him know if you have an expectation. 
And so there's three reasons why we take communion. Three reasons why it's important. This is going to be really simple tonight. Number one is to remember. Everybody say remember. In other words, you, you call it back to your memory again. Jesus said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me when he told the apostle Paul and he, he showed him what communion was all about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he, and he says, I want you to take this bread and do this in remembrance of me. This is my body which is broken for you. He didn't do it for him. He didn't need to be saved. He didn't need to be delivered. He didn't need to be set free. He didn't need to be forgiven. He didn't need the chains of alcoholism broken off of his life. I did. He did it for me. He said, this is my body and it is broken for you. He said, take, eat, because I want you to enjoy and receive what I've accomplished in my body for you. I want you to think about Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Are you seeing that he paid the price for something in you? He said, all we like, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It was at the cross of Calvary that Jesus Christ carried our sickness and our sin. And because he carried them, we don't have to carry them. Amen? Are you with me tonight? The Bible says he became sin who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. Where did Jesus take on my sin? Where did he become sin? At the cross of Calvary. And you know, that's why the Bible says that the father turned his face away from the son. And Jesus in that moment cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know why? Because God can't look on sin. Jesus became that sin. Jesus experienced separation from the Father. Jesus experienced in that moment what it was like to be completely abandoned. And in that moment, he took that from us so that we could be accepted by God, so that we can be celebrated by God, so that we can be in right standing with God. He didn't save us in our sin. He saved us from our sin. Come on, somebody. When Jesus sets you free, you are completely free indeed. And so it was the body of our Lord that, that bore the sins and sicknesses, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on that tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. That's why I'm wearing the shirt tonight. We believe at Victory Church that Jesus Christ paid for healing in our lives, spirit, soul, and body, by the stripes he took on his back before he went to the cross at Calvary. Thank God that we can be healed and made completely whole through the stripes Jesus took. This is my body, and it's broken for you. Again, Jesus didn't need to be healed. I did. I needed healing in my emotions. I needed healing in my heart. I needed healing in my body. I needed healing in my mind. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Well, how did he do that? In the body of his flesh through death. Here's why. To present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. You know that's how God sees you? He sees you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then we have the cup. Everybody say the cup. And the cup represents his blood. So we have the, the bread that represents his body broken. And then we have the cup that represents the blood that he shed for you and I. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his what? Blood. Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The life of the gospel is in the blood of Jesus Christ. I know that it's not pleasant. I know it's not something that's easy to think about. I know it's something that may be gory to you. I know it's something that might be difficult for you. But we refuse to dumb down the sacrifice our Savior made for us to make it more palatable for people. We need to understand what sin cost him so that we can appreciate our salvation. I don't want to let it go for granted. I'm not going to take it for granted. I want to maximize what he bought and paid through his blood. Jesus' best belongs to us, not because 
because of what we've done, but because of the blood he shed. The gospel without the blood is a lifeless gospel. It is a gospel void of power. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the gospel is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. Here's how he showed us. In that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I thank God today, Mickey, that it's because of the blood, there ain't going to be no double jeopardy in my life. He already poured out the penalty for my sin on the cross of Calvary so that when I meet him face to face, I don't have to be afraid of the sins of my past. He's not going to bring them up to me again. He's not going to put me on trial again. It already happened at the cross of Calvary so that when I meet Jesus, it is an excitement. It is an expectation. It is joyful because judgment for my sin was poured out at the cross cross. The anger of God against sin can be seen in what happened at the cross of Calvary. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Aren't y'all thankful for that the blood of Jesus brings us near to the Father? It's through the blood we have access into the presence of God. It's through the blood that we can be bold. It's why we pray big and bold and crazy prayers at Victory Church. It's because the blood was a big sacrifice and we refuse to pray little prayers. Come on, somebody. He paid a big price so that we can live a big life and we're going to ask big. We're going to live big. We're going to praise big. We're going to celebrate big. We're going to give big. We're going to witness big. Why? Because we got a big God, and he's as big as you'll let him be. The blood. Never forget the blood. Number one, remember. Number two, release. Everybody say release. That's what I love. God gives us over and over and over throughout the Bible, things we can touch to help us release our faith. He knows that we're a people who are driven by sight, Michelle, and by touch. Sometimes we need something that we can grab hold of. Isn't that true? Uh, and, and so that's exactly what he gave us. I, I want you to think about Thomas. He said, I, Nikki, I'm not going to believe that Jesus is alive unless I personally put my finger through the holes in his hands and I touch his side. And when Jesus showed up, what did he say? He didn't, he didn't rebuke Thomas. He said, hey, Thomas, come here. I want you to touch something. I want you to see something. He gave Thomas what he needed to believe. He didn't rebuke Thomas, but he did say this. He said, blessed are those who have never seen and still believe. Blessed are those who have never touched and still believe. I've never touched Jesus, but you know what? I, I personally feel like I don't need to because he's touched me. Amen. And that touch is so real. When you've been touched by God. We're going to be talking about that Sunday. But communion is a place where we can release our faith. It's what we call a point of contact. Communion is a point of contact. And Jesus gives us that. And I'm so thankful for that. Passover was a point of contact, Tom. God gave them the blood of a lamb. Something they could physically touch. Something they could go out and he made them a part of it. And he said, you can physically take the hyssop branch and apply it over the door of your home. It was something they could see. It was scented. Something they could feel in their fingers. And it was a reminder. Leah, it was an opportunity for them to release their faith. Not in the blood of a lamb because there was nothing magic about the blood of a lamb. But it was their obedience to what God said that opened a door for them to experience what God promised. And so we see that over and over through the, the point of contact. I want you to think about the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all remember her? For 12 years she had a flow of blood. What did she say? She said, if only I may touch, what? The hem of his garment. The, the word there for him in Hebrew is literally wings. And they knew that the rabbi would wear a prayer shawl and there would be one of those tassels hanging on each of the four corners of that prayer shawl and through that tassel would run an a, a, a indigo colored thread 
as a reminder of them to be obedient to the law of God. And so when she said, if only I can touch the hem of his garment, what she was reaching out for was the word of God. She was reaching out for the promises of God. Well, Jesus is the word made flesh. And Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, hundreds of years earlier said to us that the son of righteousness would rise with healing in his wings. She knew that verse as a good Jewish girl. She was reaching out for healing in the wings, healing in the tassels. What was it? A point of contact. It wasn't nothing special about the tassel. It was not a lucky rabbit's foot. This is not superstition. It was a place in time where she said, at that moment, I'm going to release my faith for God to heal me. And that's exactly what she did. When she reached out, Ed, and she grabbed hold of that tassel, in that moment, the Bible says that Jesus felt power flow out of his body. And what did he do? He turned around and he said, somebody touched me. It was a point of contact. Again, that's exactly what happens through the laying on of hands. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who, he who does not believe shall be condemned. These signs, these signs will follow those who believe. We don't follow signs. Signs follow us. Come on, end time church. You better wake up and get that. In my name, they'll cast out demons. That's still for today. They'll speak in two new tongues. That's still for today. They'll take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it'll no, by no means hurt them. Come on, y'all. Pastor Tim, bring out snakes. <laughs> Protection is still for today because there's stories behind those. The last thing he says is they'll lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. What is that? A point of contact. We have the anointing of oil in the New Testament, book of James, Jesus' brother. James 5, 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. What is it? A point of contact. There's nothing special about olive oil. Same stuff they use at Olive Garden. <laughs> Ain't nobody getting healed at Olive Garden, especially if you're eating Tour, tour of Italy. <laughs> Y'all knew it was coming. Somebody newer to the church was like, he sure brings up going to the restroom a lot. <laughs> Welcome to Victory Church. You're never going to sleep. Paul's handkerchiefs, right? They took handkerchiefs that had touched the body of the Apostle Paul. And that anointing is tangible. You can feel it. It's transferable. And they took those handkerchiefs, those cloths from his body. And when they just touched the sick, they got healed. How about Peter's shadow? Another point of contact. They knew that when his shadow came by, what was the difference there? When they knew when his shadow was coming down the road, when he was walking, they knew at that moment, I'm going to believe that God's going to heal me. That's a point of contact. That's what communion's all about, y'all. It's about releasing our faith in that moment to receive what Jesus Christ bought and paid for at the cross of Calvary. So when we take communion, and this is why I'm spending a night on this. This is a big deal. When, when I eat that bread, I'm not eating this gross little wafer that is just horrific. It is. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. I'm not drinking some watered-down grape juice that tastes like a melted freezy pop. It's what it represents. And in that moment, I'm releasing my faith, Brother Daniel, for everything Jesus did through his sacrifice that we celebrate this week to come to pass in my body because I don't want to miss out on anything he bought. If you give me a gift and I don't use it, that's disrespectful. What a great gift. Amen? Amen? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you give him thanks for his gift tonight? So the first one is remember. The second one is release, the power of God's promise. And the third one is retail. Everybody say retail. I'm not talking about going shopping, ladies. I'm not talking about retail therapy, okay? I mean retail, to literally tell again. And here's what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, it says, For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. 
talking to a friend tonight before church when they came in. I said, you look like a preacher. He said, I wish I was a preacher. I said, hey, we're all preachers. Y'all are preaching the gospel just by taking communion tonight. You realize that? You're literally preaching the gospel. Sinless life. Amen. Substitutionary. Death. Resurrection. And ascension. When you take communion, it literally says you're retelling the gospel until Jesus comes back. Can I remind you, church, he's coming back. Can I remind you, church, he's coming back. Can, can I just say again that he's coming back. And we can never, ever, ever lose sight of this because it's so critical. Those who live expecting his return will do the most for the kingdom of God. At Victory Church, we constantly keep our eye on the fact that Jesus is coming again. And when we meet him face to face, we want to have something to show for what he gave us at the cross of Calvary. We want to have something to show for the grace that he gave to you and me. He's coming again. He's coming again. He's coming again like a thief in the night. He's coming back again with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. He's going to leave heaven with a shout. The eastern sky is going to split. The dead in Christ will be raised first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds. And together we will be be with the Lord forever. And the Bible says, comfort one another with these words. We do not sorrow as those who have no hope. Jesus is coming again. And this weekend, we celebrate the resurrection. Death is dead. Jesus is alive. And so that's what we're talking about. And we're looking for and we're looking forward to it. Now, let me bring it really close to home for you. I got a call last night about 9.30. It's one of my great friends, Paul Schweitzer. Thought, I'm sitting on the couch watching TV with Marsha. I'm like, 9.30 at night, Paul, what, do you, what Bible question do you have tonight? Because if you knew Paul, that's the way he was. And so, it's Janina, his wife, and she's hysterical. She says he's not breathing. So we come into agreement and we pray. And time goes by, and we said, call us back. We want to hear from you. Let us know what's going on. And she, we don't hear from her. We don't hear from her. We don't hear from her. Marsha calls her back. We can't understand what's going on. She's hysterical. And so I begin reaching out to some friends. I ask all of our leadership team to pray. We don't know what's happening. We know something's wrong. And I call the ER, and I say, I'm looking. I'm, I'm the pastor of Paul Schweitzer. He just came in. He's not responsive. He's not breathing. And she said, you need to come to be with his wife. And last night, Paul, who sat right there every single week for the last 11 years, went home to be with Jesus Christ as his Lord. He's in heaven right now. And it's devastating. It's devastating. I can't even wrap my head around it. I, if it was a heart attack or something, I could have handled it. He choked. He choked on something he was eating. And so we go to the hospital, and, you know, it's exactly what you would expect. His wife is a mess. His stepdaughter, Naomi, who is a daughter, is a mess. She said, he's the only man who ever loved me. Marsha picks up the phone, says, hey, has anybody told his daughter, Tanya? They said, no, we, I mean, they, they're in no condition to do that. Marsha calls Tanya, and Tanya greets Marsha on the phone. Hey, Marsha, how are you tonight? And Marsha has to deliver the worst news you could ever tell somebody. And she falls apart on the phone. Yeah, I know he's with Jesus, right? That's good news. But it's still a really, really, really hard loss. This was a guy who was a fearless lover of people. This was a guy who was most passionate in his life about one thing, and that was telling other people about Jesus Christ. He only wore Victory Church shirts. It was a Wednesday night like this when we were still at Center Street at the Little White Church. He came in. He had been wrestling with alcohol and addiction for four decades of his life. And we laid hands on him, point of contact. And in one night, God broke all the addictions in his life. He tried drinking one more time, but there was one problem. I had, my, part of my prayer was, Lord, if he drinks again, I prayed that he would just be made nauseous. 
And he tried to drink it one more time and he got sick. <laughs> like, see what you get? But it was such a tough loss. Why am I telling you that in this context? Very simply because we remember what Jesus did for us. That he lived, he died, and he rose again as the first fruits, as the first one of a harvest of many other sons and daughters who would be raised from the dead after him. We do this to release the power of God. Tonight, we need to pray for Janina, for Naomi, for Tanya, for their families, and to cover them, and to just love them, and to just celebrate them. But we also do it to retell this story, that Jesus is coming back again. Have you ever taken a magnet and you, and you take it and run it across a table like those iron filings. You remember the iron filings that, and the magnet would grab them, Rick, and snatch them up, right? And you could hover it over the table and they weren't even touching it. It would lift it off the table and grab it. But here's the thing. A magnet doesn't work with aluminum. A magnet only works with a metal uh, that has the same material in it that's in the magnet. It's got to have iron in it. It's got to have steel in it. Well, the Bible says in Romans 8 that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living on the inside of you. And when Jesus comes back and he descends from heaven, here's why you're going up. Because when he gets close enough, there's something in you that's in him. And just like when you hover a magnet over that metal and it starts, it starts shaking and it starts moving. That's what we're doing right now. Heaven is hovering over us and we're moving with heaven. We're quaking with heaven. We're shaking with heaven. Come on, somebody. But when that trumpet blows, he ain't coming to earth that time. He's coming down low enough so that we go up. And Paul Schweitzer's body is coming out of that grave ahead of mine. And I'm going to be chasing him. That's why we take communion. You still think it's just a ritual? So do me a favor. While you're standing on your feet, would you grab that cup and that bread? Get it in your hand tonight. Go on and open that bread up. It's going to take you a second because it's like opening up a Benadryl. As my Nana would say, hateful little things, aren't they? Get it in your hand. Get it ready. We're about to sing. Oh, come to the altar. And I just believe in God for an encounter tonight. America needs Jesus. Everybody knows that. But I need Jesus. I don't need him any less today than the day he saved me. That's right. How many of y'all need him? So as we take communion tonight, I want you to release your faith for God to show up in your life in a really, really big way, in a really special way. I want you to get that bread in your hand right now. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you, Lord, that by your stripes we're healed. We thank you that when your body was pierced, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And it released your spirit, God. It's no longer contained in a building made by the hands of man. But now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Lord, tonight as we receive the bread, we receive everything you've done for us in your body. We thank you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you eat the bread? The Bible says in the same manner, He took the cup, he gave thanks, and he blessed it. And he said, I want you to drink this in remembrance of me. This is the new covenant in 
my blood, which is shed for you. Thank God for the blood. There's life in the blood. Father, we thank you tonight for your wisdom. We thank you for your plan. We thank you, Jesus, for your obedience and your example. Thank you for your sacrifice. Couldn't be any more undeserving. You saw something worth saving. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for washing away our sins. Thank you for taking away our past. Thank you for redeeming our future. Thank you for rewriting our story. As we receive the blood tonight, we receive redemption, that we are free. Satan ain't got nothing on us. He got nothing in us. So as we take the blood tonight, let the life that you poured out for us flow through us to the world around us. Let us be vessels of redemption. In Jesus' name, you may drink the cup. The Bible says after they did that, if they sang a hymn together before they went out. And I'm so, so glad to have my nephew Bose home with us tonight. You guys, many of you know him. Give it up for him tonight. Guys, just kill the house lights. Let's just have an intimate moment with Jesus. I want you to get alone with him right now and let's sing this song to the Lord. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is called. come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide for
let's give him praise. Who needs a healing tonight? If you need a healing, would you just come down here to the altar, just like we just sang about? I'm so thankful tonight that he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He was healing yesterday. He's healing today, right now. And he'll still be healing you tomorrow. Amen? There's nothing God cannot heal. There's nothing broken he cannot make whole. For everyone in your seats tonight, I want you to reach your hands towards that camera because there are going to be people who are going to watch this. Some of you who are at home, you're at work, you've got this playing in your car right now, and you need what's happening here to happen in your life. By faith, we extend our hand towards you, the hand of faith. And we release the power of God's promises into your situation. We take authority over sicknesses and disease in your body. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what your family tree tells you. In Christ, you have a new family tree. And it's the tree of Calvary. And by faith in His blood, we erase anything and everything wrong with your blood. Blood disorders have to go in the authority of Jesus Christ. Terminal disease, we take authority over we bind and we rebuke and we cast out of your body in the name of Jesus. We declare in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. That is a promise to cling to and to go to war with and to fight with every single day. Devil, we bind you. We rebuke you. We declare sickness and disease and brokenness are trespassers in that loved one's body right now, that person watching today. And we command you to leave in the authority of Jesus Christ. We command change to be broken. We command hearts to be healed. We command tormented minds to experience release and re reprieve right now in the authority of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you that it's done. We claim your victory in the mighty name of Jesus. We release your peace, your power, your presence, your purpose. We declare they're favored. We declare everything they touch does well. We declare over you good things are happening. We release the anointing into your life in the name of Jesus. We declare you are blessed and highly favored. You're blessed coming in and going out. You're the head and you're not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. Victory is yours and not defeat. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In the name of Jesus, receive it by faith. We love you so much. And we praise God for what he's done in your life. We'd love to hear from you. Share that with us. Same thing for those of you here tonight that have received ministry. We want to hear from you what God's done in your life, either through worship, through the word, or through the laying on of hands. I don't know about y'all. This is everything I hoped it'd be tonight. Come on, somebody. Give Jesus a big praise. Amen. All right. Now I'm messed up. I'm ready for Saturday and Sunday. So y'all grab somebody. Come back. We will have a great time. We love you. God bless you. Guys, if we could bring the house lights up, please don't forget, wipe out those invite cards as you leave. Take as many as you want. Put them in a gas station. Leave them wherever you want to leave them. Glitter in Jesus' name. Love you. God bless you. See you Sunday.